best shots I've ever made in my whole life. Hands down, best shot I've ever made. It's him, man. That's that five by six. Some of the most meaningful experiences of my life have come when I've been hunting elk. A lot of my self-esteem, my self-worth, how I feel, the sense of satisfaction that I get from elk hunting and being successful in the elk woods means a ton to me. It's part of my identity. And I know how much some of you guys want it. I know how frustrating it can be. I know that it can seem insurmountable, but it's doable. And I promise if you just take the steps, you get your ducks in your row and you do absolutely everything that you need to, you can be successful in the elk woods, and I promise you it's an experience that can change your life. I know that it has mine. This series is going to break down the individual steps that I think you need to take to find success, because that's the ultimate goal. And there's nothing like finding success in the elk woods every September. So come along with us. We're going to include a bunch of information that's going to help shorten your learning curve and help you tag out later this fall. I'm going to take you through five pillars of archery elk hunting. First and foremost, picking an area. If you don't know where you're going to go hunting, you really got to know where to go. So you got to pick a good unit. You got to pick the area within that unit. And you got to know what you're looking for in those areas and why you think it might hold elk. Number two, gear and weapon proficiency. You got to be proficient with your weapon. You got to know how to set the thing up. You got to know how to sight it in. You have to know the specific arrows, sight rests, broadheads. You have to make sure that everything is tuned so that you're working in one conjunction with that bow and arrow. Also, your gear. You got to know your gear. You got to know the pieces that you're going to need, the individual items that are going to help you be more successful, uh, kind of the things that you can ditch and the things that are must-haves. So gear is a major component and definitely a pillar of elk hunting. Number three, physical fitness. Physical fitness is a major component of elk hunting. These are big animals that live in rugged terrain. It takes the most out of you. If you're going to hunt elk, you've got to have good physical fitness. And if you want to be successful in the woods with your bow and arrow chasing elk, you have to have good cardio, good legs, strong upper body, strong core. There's a good chance you're going to end up packing an elk over a long distance if you harvest one. So physical fitness is a major component of being a successful elk hunter. Number four, planning. That's taking all that effort that you put into picking an area and actually planning your hunt. Where you're going to be, why you're going to be there, what time of day, and being able to execute on that plan in the field. That comes with a lot of map work. So you're going to want to know how to use your maps in the field to navigate and execute on a hunt plan. So hunt planning actually to get out in the field is super important. And for me, it's my fourth pillar. Number five, and I think this is probably the most critical, is actually executing a shot in the field. I know a lot of people every year that put themselves into close proximity to elk that don't harvest. They end up messing up the shot in crunch time. I think the fifth pillar for me is actually being able to execute a shot under pressure when it matters the most. So for me, that's my fifth pillar, and we're going to run through all five of them and hopefully give you guys some information that's going to make you more successful this fall. All right, guys, assuming that you actually got lucky in one of the state draws and you drew a permit, maybe that's Wyoming, maybe it's Utah, Arizona, whatever the state might be, assuming that you already have a tag in your pocket, the first steps for me, typically after I draw an elk tag, is to just do some Google searching. I like to pull up Google. I like to search the unit, archery elk in the phrase, and I just like to cruise through and see what resources are available to me. I read a lot of forums, including, you know, Rock Slide, monster muleys back in the day whatever the forum might be i cruise down through those and i'm reading those entire threads and the reason i'm doing that is because i'm looking for little tidbits within that a lot of people might list an area some people might list an area to avoid uh, they might list access information or you know hunting pressure situations but there's a lot of information that can be gleaned from that and from those i'm making notes as i go so i'm using my insider hunt planner and i'm adding notes as i go uh, I also think YouTube is a great resource. A lot of the times you can find hunts that have occurred within your unit. That's going to give you a look at the landscape, give you an idea of what the terrain might look like before you even get there. And that's just a simple step that I like to do. It's typically something that I don't put a ton of effort into, maybe a day or so. 
I just like to read the comments and see what kind of information I can glean from the internet to then add to my haunt portfolio or my plan as I go. One of the next steps I like to take is I like to just pick up the phone and call a biologist for the unit that I drew. Now, there's kind of mixed feelings about calling biologists because a lot of people assume that they're going to give you the same information that they gave the previous five guys that just called them. And that might be the case if you call them with very generic questions. If you call a biologist and say, where are the elk? They're going to tell you some very general information on where the elk are. But if you've done some work prior to calling a biologist, you've got some areas picked out. Maybe those are areas that you learn from your Google searches. The more specific questions that you can ask a biologist, the better information that you're going to get in return and the more talkative they're going to be. That goes for the same thing with a game warden. Any of those types of professionals, BLM, Forest Service, game warden, biologists, the more information that you can give them to get the conversation rolling, the better information that you're going to get in return. One of the next steps after that is actually pulling up maps. And I look at map work as kind of a three-pass phase, if you will. Uh, First pass, I'm looking at the hunt unit, just the boundaries of it, where it's at in proximity to the state, where it's at in proximity to highways and roads and how I'm going to get there. That's just a simple thing that you, you got to know before you actually go on your hunt. Uh, the next thing I look at often is your public private land layer. That's just going to give me an idea on how much land I have to hunt and if there's going to be private land access issues. And that's probably the first pass that I make, just private public and I'm looking at that. Uh, third thing I look at a lot in that first pass is going to be roads and trails. I'm just looking for the access points. I know if I'm a backpack hunter, I'm looking for areas that have more wilderness terrain. I'm looking for areas that are more removed from roads and trails. That's going to give me the ability to backpack and distance myself from other hunters. If I'm a guy that's out on my first elk hunt, I just want to hunt from a base camp. I want to make sure I know where the roads are. So I want to explore that and and kind of get a good idea of my access points. Wilderness, I kind of already mentioned that, but I want to know where the wilderness areas are within that unit. If you're looking at a state like Wyoming, you can't hunt a wilderness area as a non-resident without a guide or a resident accompanying you. So that's an area that I want to avoid because I can't legally hunt as a non-resident. If I'm hunting in another state like Colorado, that wilderness might provide refuge to elk that I may be able to access if I'm willing to backpack hunt and distance myself from other hunters. So I like to look at the wilderness uh, layer within my maps. Third, really important to elk, wildfires. I always like to pull that wildfire layer in and look at the year of the burn. There is a window there where burns are very productive in elk country, and I would typically say it's anywhere from that two to maybe 10-year window. You get above and beyond that, it's not as productive, but if you're within that window, maybe two to 10 years, Typically, if it's within elk range, it's going to be really good elk habitat because the feed that comes back after a wildfire is like ice cream to elk. They typically love it. The other thing is you're looking within wildfire layers is you're looking for the type of burn. You can kind of zoom in and look at the aerial imagery. And what I'm looking for in wildfire layers is I'm looking for a nice mosaic burn. I want a lot of edge habitat. I want some stands of live timber that's going to provide bedding cover uh, in close proximity to those burn areas where they can get out and feed on those brand new succulent grasses and forbs that are coming up. So I like to look for mosaics within that wildfire layer. Next is water. Water is super important to elk. So I look at water a lot and I've shot a lot of bulls over water, whether that be a water hole or a wallow, which is those wet spots that those bulls will come in to wallow. It's basically turn themselves into a walking billboard for those cows and calves. So I particularly pay attention to water sources. Uh, Another little tidbit for you concerning water. Elk prefer standing water to water at. It's higher in nutrients, you get that little mineral bump. And secondly, running water causes them maybe not to hear as well as they do over standing water. So those little seeps and springs, ponds, if you're in drier country, maybe it's a cattle stock pond or a cattle tank, those become really important because elk prefer to water at those types of areas. It's not to say that they won't water in a running water, but they prefer standing water, and I found that to be the case. So that's kind of my first pass, the things that I'm looking at. Uh, I'm looking at the hot unit. I'm looking at private public lands. I'm looking at roads and trails. I'm looking at wilderness layers. I'm looking at wildfire, and I'm looking at water. 
Moving on to what I would suggest is like my second pass, kind of that deeper dive into where elk are going to be. I want to start looking at things like habitat concentration areas. I want to start looking at migration routes. I want to look at things like water and wallows, and I want to do that with historical imagery. I want to be able to compare year over year to see what those areas look like. In a lot of cases, I can find those wet meadows and those wallow areas where water is going to be standing, and it's good habitat for those elk to come in and wallow. I can find those by looking at aerial imagery. So you want to use that. The next tool, which is super important, and I highly suggest it. I don't know if as many people use it as they should, but that's that terrain analysis tool within your Go Hunt maps. That's going to give you the ability to look at the unit by slope and by aspect. So elk prefer bedding on flatter terrain. So anywhere from zero to maybe 20 degrees is going to be preferred bedding area. They're a big animal. They like to lay down, have a nice flat spot. It's not to say that they won't use those other areas, but if you're looking at better in cover, it's typically a more gradual slope. They love benches, they love ridge lines, and all of that information is available to you very easily with that terrain analysis tool. Another thing that elk really love during that archery time frame, they love dark timber because they need that shade. You got to remember they're trying to thermoregulate, maintain their body temperature. So they're most often going to bed on those big north, northeast, northwest facing slopes where there's a lot of shade. That's primary bedding cover. If you can find that in relation to nice escape routes and saddles and feeding areas, and it's got water, and it's got these little benches and pockets and seeps, you're going to be in an area that's going to hold elk. Elk are just like any of us. They have things that they prefer and they like. It's their habitat. It's their core they're going to go to it. So if you find these relationships between these types of environments, you're going to find elk. Uh, moving on, I like to pull up and look at a topo map. Um, topo maps, a lot of people might think are a little bit antiquated. Maybe they don't use them as much as they used to. But one thing about a topo map is it really allows you to see those benches really, really well. And if you can find a nice bench on a north-facing pocket with a little bit of water, there's going to be elk there. So I like to use a topo map because it makes those saddles and benches very apparent when you're looking at go hunt maps. Once again, fire layers, I can't stress that enough. Fire layers are super important to finding elk. I can't emphasize to you enough how important fire can be to elk and elk herds. So I always look at that and I look at it in relationship to the other features that I already talked about. And then lastly, it's going to depend a little bit on the time of year of your hunt. If you're scouting from July through August prior to your hunt starting, you're going to want to identify glassing points. You're going to find those areas where you can look into those drainage, you can look into those pockets, and you're going to be able to find those bulls. It's going to depend on when your hunt opens up in any given state on how you hunt them. You know, September time frame, those bulls are pretty active. They're moving, they're pushing cows. But glassing points are still going to be vital to help you find elk and then use those as a jump off point to go into that country and use your bugle tube, your cow call to actually find, hunt, and harvest bull elk. So I would say that's kind of my structure as far as using maps. Um, That's the whole series as far as uh, that goes. It's kind of my first step in being able to find elk. 